Greetings, cinephiles. Are you looking for a movie analysis podcast that stands above the rest? Then look no further than Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters. We analyze good movies, we analyze bad movies, and yes, we also analyze the in-betweens of the world of cinema. So if you like what you hear, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. And yes, my friends, we are 420 friendly. So when you listen to us, smoke smoke it if you've you've got got it. it. And now... Here's a new episode of Collateral Gaming. The show starts right now. Tonight on the bonus round, it's survival horror time as we discuss two PlayStation 1 survival horror classics, that being Resident Evil Survivor and Clock Tower. So stick around. The show starts right now. Welcome to Collateral Gaming Bonus Round. I'm Ashley Chancellor. And I'm Bo Maddox. And we are podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas. And yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, smoke it if you've got it. And yeah, I guess we're smoking something here. (laughs) I I don't know what. I guess it's Delta 10 or something. Yeah, we've got our Delta 10. We've got some beers. We're going to have a good night talking about the survival horror genre. Uh, something we've gotten into a little bit with in uh, Collateral Gaming. I mean, we've discussed Resident Evil. We've discussed Outlast. But tonight, we're going to talk about something very special. I asked Bo to be on this episode because Zach and I uh, just weren't able to coordinate something. He was sick. And, you know, I wanted to get a bonus round episode out because it, it feels like it's been a while since we've even since we've been done a bonus round. Hell, it's been a while since we've even done a goddamn director's cut for Collateral Cinema. I mean, right? shit. Um, and I asked Bo, I said, you know, hey, man, look in your, you know, PS1, your your PlayStation Classic catalog and let me know of something you want to talk about. My, and Might I add my modded PS1 Classic with Auto Beam and RetroArch, the latest version, I might add, version 9. Exactly. And uh, we came up with the idea to talk about survival horror. Uh, It started out with uh, talking about Resident Evil Survivor. I think originally we wanted to do a commentary or something on that. And eventually that evolved into us uh, wanting to pair that up with something else. And so tonight we have a very special episode uh, planned. We have a bad survival horror game (laughs) and a great survival horror game. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I mean, we eventually tried to have two bad survival horror games, but I just couldn't find a ROM for, I don't know, what were we looking for? I don't think it was even survival horror, it was just a Resident evil S game. It was the Crow, the Crow City of Angels, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, so we were trying to find something adjacent, something that kind of fit the Resident Evil survivor, um, and, uh, and Clock Tower is what we came up with, but I guess we'll start talking about Resident Evil survivor. Yeah. It's interesting that this is actually the first full-on first-person Resident Evil game. Yeah, this actually is before, you know, well before uh, Biohazard ever came out. And and probably one of the reasons why Capcom waited so long to do a first-person Resident Evil series is probably has something to do with how spectacularly this one failed. Oh, man. I mean, just playing through it just a while ago, I mean, it's like, it it really makes you appreciate the pre-rendered backgrounds in the original Resident Evil games. It does. Like, 100%. I mean, those actually added detail to the backgrounds. I mean, made it a lot easier to see where your items were at and whatnot. And they were just far more interesting to look at. I mean, this just looks like shitty corridors and everything, man. And PS1 had plenty of shitty corridor shooters and corridor games like that. So, I mean, this was just kind of topping topping off uh, the pile of shit with some sprinkles here, so to speak. Yeah, and, and this to me feels more like a light gun shooter than it does a survival horror game. In fact, 
Honestly, I feel like this game could have probably been a lot better as just a straight-up arcade game. I would have been excusable. Which is interesting because that's eventually what we got kind of in the in-between between Code Veronica and Resident Evil 4 is that we did get some... Uh, we did get some Resident Evil light gun rail games. I mean, they, they weren't really arcade, though. They were released on the PS2. But, I mean, this one actually had support for light guns in the Japanese release. Right. But for some weird reason, they took that out, and it's like, man, this would actually have been pretty successful had you had that. I mean, you would have had the original, you know, exploration dynamics, and you would have had a new gameplay element there, you know? It actually would have made a lot more sense, because this game does feel awkward as fuck playing on a PlayStation 1 controller. I mean... First off, the game doesn't utilize all of its buttons. I it really, I mean, <clears throat> you do you, you have uh, w one of the trigger buttons R1 allows you to go into aim mode and then you press X to shoot. And that's almost all there is to it. Uh, you can do a quick turnaround. Uh, you can run, but there is no quick reload button. You have to go into the menu to do it. Although it does reload automatically when you empty yeah, but that reload is not nearly quick enough. I mean, it, it has a little bit of a delay, and that, that really just breaks up the flow of the gameplay whenever you're trying to shoot enemies on screen. Yeah, you know? and taking away from the survival horror aspect, of course, is there are an unlimited there's an unlimited amount of ammo, which is kind of weird for a Resident Evil game. I think that they were just kind of acknowledging how shoddy the controls were when it came to shooting. Yeah. Because, to, I mean, to be fair, with most first person, any type of rail shooter on the PS1 where you didn't have a light gun, where like if you weren't able to get like a gun con or another peripheral, like you had to use the that reticle on there. Now, now at, at some point when you had the analog, I mean, that made it a little easier to control. But you know, on that fucking D pad, like what we have on the PS Classic, it's just it's just not up to snuff. It's no. not nearly sensitive enough. I mean, I saw that you like you were like going off target all the time, and it's because you're trying to overcorrect for the the bad controls. Yeah. So you've got, of course, because you only have the D pad. Um, unless you know, maybe maybe the game can be played differently if you had the Dual Shock controller. I don't know. Probably. I mean, it did come out after Resident Evil Three, so there would have been uh, analog support. Maybe it would play a little differently if we had it, but. I have a feeling maybe not by much. Like maybe you would, like maybe you would uh, correct the uh, the drag on the controller a little bit. The the problem is is that you know it's a first person game that well I'm not even gonna say it's a problem because tank controls work in first person. It's just they have to be done well, and when you're in the aiming mode, you need to have that accuracy, uh, and you just don't here, mind you. Okay, this came out before, just just right before the next console generation of Resident Evil games. Like this was, and but after the you know original three games, and and so you know not only is it is it trying to compete with these next gen games that are coming, and it does miserably, but it doesn't even it's not even impressive. It's less impressive than the three games that preceded it. Absolutely. I mean, story-wise, it is absolutely the most cliched bullshit I've ever seen. I mean, it, it, it's literally a uh, case of mistaken identity type of thing, and it's really... It, it was trite in video games, you know, like in the previous generation. You Wait, know? am I Vincent? Am I Vincent? <laughs> That's right. I am Vincent. Yeah, what? So, no, wait. I'm not a Vincent. I'm actually a detective. I was sitting here by my good friend, Leon, Leon S. Kennedy. Kennedy. <laughs> He's, oh, the voice acting is exactly like that. I mean, yeah, Resident Evil has a long history of bad voice acting, like going all the way back to the original game. Mm -hmm. but, but it was charming it, there. It had character to it, and, you know, it actually kind of added to the game. Here, You're it's, almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> here, it's just it just drops the ball. It's like nothing's interesting. That like none of the dialogue sticks, and 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 then when you try to actually pair it with the animations during the cutscenes, it's like it was so lazily made. I mean, they're literally like just looping movements, you mm -hmm. know. 
Yeah, no, this game is lazy as fuck. And even the puzzles. You know, we, we know the combat sucks, whatever, but can the puzzles at least be Resident Evil puzzles? And they're... <sighs> They're puzzles done in the Resident Evil style. They're just not nearly as intricate and complex, not to mention the fact that there is no thought to it. You collect an item, and usually in the same room or the adjacent room, you use that item, and you don't even have to press any buttons. Everything is automated. There is no action button. You walk automatically through doors. You automatically use the right item in the right place, so there's no decision-making to be made. And and there you lose that sense of Resident Evil where you know there are all, all this backtracking going around. I mean, I, I have so many memories now of walking around Arclay Mansion or the Raccoon City Police Department, you know, taking this item and thinking, oh, this goes here, or where the fuck am I going to find this, or where the fuck am I, what the fuck am I going to do with this? None of that is here. Like I said, the puzzles are so straightforward, they're just boring. There's almost no point to them. And, and they're just, it's, it's just, it's like teasing us and you have the map you have rooms uh uh extra rooms that you can go off of that you want to explore that you fill off your map but there's just because the game is so linear and doesn't allow you to backtrack through areas you've been in previously and and the fact that the layouts just aren't that complex it's like it's just a very watered down resident evil experience all around it's and, and not to mention a watered down rail shooter because i mean that it, it pretty much is a rail shooter just with like the intimation of exploration you know yeah and and yeah when I mean, you're going back to the puzzles it's like no none of them are intuitive at all and that's what uh resident evil pr- puzzles are actually famous for you know it's like they're very intuitive uh, puzzle designs you know yeah resident evil uh it, it, is one of those games that really makes you think there's some head scratchers. The remakes have even gone in and tried to make these puzzles more complex. And um, and in this game, it's like, it, it's just a shot to the face. The enemies, I mean, the combat is terrible. The enemies are fucking easy. I mean, we played this on normal and I maybe died a couple of times because I just wasn't really taking it very seriously. But it, it's not that hard. I mean, I will say they're not very liberal with the items, but given the unlimited ammo and the fact that they just kind of throw random Resident Evil enemies from the previous three games at you at, in places that don't make a lot of sense, I mean, you'll see some tyrants, but they actually go down in a few hits, so I don't know what the fuck the point is of them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember in the original Resident Evil, the 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 hunters, you know, like you remember the lizards, it's like those were creatures that you were just like oh shit i better get the cult out and fucking deal with these motherfuckers but here it's like i mean you don't even need to use any other weapons even like like you said it has that infinite ammo and it's like wh- why use anything else you could just pump be you could just pump them full of handgun rounds and it doesn't even take that many rounds to bring any of the bigger enemies down anyways so no, and what's funny is like the bosses, for instance, are just have the laziest AI. There's no, there's no difficulty. There's no tension. This game is is very much a more action focused game. You know, more reminiscent, I'd say, I guess, of Resident Evil Four, Five, Six. But and we, uh, and we all know how that went. Yeah, you know, I, as soon, as, as sooner or later, you begin punching boulders and everything. I mean, it just, <laughs> you know, it just leads to absurdity. But I I still feel like this isn't nearly as good of an experience. I mean, Resident Evil 4 is still considered a a, a good game despite being less survival horror focused. Um, and this game has none of that. No, it doesn't even it doesn't have any of the real survival horror elements, and it doesn't even have good action elements. It, it fails on both levels. <laughs> you know, it's funny too because it. I, I, I feel kind of, it doesn't feel right to actually implement it as a survival horror game because it's really not. No. But I, I guess we'll consider that, you know, it, it's a poor example of the survival horror genre. It, it fits in there because it's Resident Evil and because it has some of the mechanics of the survival horror Resident Evil. Yeah, yeah. But there is no inventory management, is there? I mean, is no, there. No, it, there's not even that. I mean, you, you don't even actually go and examine any of your items which if you remember in the previous resident evil games and then after that that's an important part of figuring out certain puzzles and everything and even in procuring certain items is you know like uh like for instance you know those uh books where you get like the eagle medallion or you know the 
the lion medallion and whatnot. It's like, I mean, that's an integral part of Resident Evil, and they just dropped the ball on it. Completely. Completely. And also, I mean, usually the written parts, like of all the notes that you find, like that usually adds to the story a little bit, but here it just seems like, you know, incidental. No, and, and what's what, what's crazy is like you know yeah you do have some of those uh, additional you know lore documents that you can find, but they feel very scripted and easy to place. There's no sense of exploring and learning about more of the story because you took the initiative. It's kind of like yeah, well this was placed obviously for him, here for, for him, me to look yeah, at for him to find and for you to read. It's, and it's and forced. I didn't really care that much about it. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't, you know, and I, I have a difficult time even accepting this into the Resident Evil canon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't even see where it really sits canonically. I mean, the only, the only, like we said before, the only real connection is, you know, bringing up Leon S. Kennedy, you know? The, like The that's intro le- to the game references, like, the destruction of Raccoon City and some of the shit that was going down with Umbrella. Yeah, but after that, it's just like, you know... It's just it could pretty much be its own game, and you pretty much could take the zombies out of it. And it could be anything else. It could be anything else. And, and like I said, if this were just a horror game, I could or not a horror game. If this were just a, a light gun arcade game, like I could accept that. Yeah, I, I I could I could I could I would be okay with it because I understand that when I'm playing you know on an arcade machine, it's not going to be the same experience as I have when I'm playing a Resident Evil game. And the fact that they had the balls to even put this on the PlayStation 1. Yeah, I know. I mean, hell, by this point, the Dreamcast was already out. They could have made a better version of it and put it on that, probably. You know why the North American version didn't have the the uh, the light gun uh, peripheral compatibility? Oh, it was because of Columbine. It was it? because of Columbine. Yeah, that, that happened not too long after, yeah. But then, I don't know, just don't fucking release the game. It wasn't that great anyway. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, if, if, if that's what you're worried about, just don't fucking release the game then because... Yeah, just, just put all your resources into the next generation. I mean, by this point, they were already uh, they were about to announce the Capcom 5. And, you know, of course, you know, the Resident Evil remake was part of that. Like, they, they should have just, you know, they could have gotten that out a lot earlier if they would have just, you know allocated the resources correctly it's like that's true i mean or like i said you know make it a make it a pc game or make it a dreamcast game i mean i mean they pretty much released code veronica on the dreamcast first that Maybe was the first one you know i think that's the problem with the resident evil series historically has been them trying to pump out so much content and it's like no you don't have to you can wait a little while and actually develop something you know save your remakes for sure throw some remakes in there in between your main series games yeah you know have a couple spinoffs and whatnot but you don't have to go all out you don't have to keep pumping things out for the sake of pumping them out people are okay with waiting and and in fact that strategy is working better now right now pretty much all the resident evil we've been getting is what you know we got the the resident evil 2 remake then we got resident evil uh, 7 biohazard and then we got the resident evil 3 remake and then we got village and now we're getting the resident evil 4 remake and I, uh, next we'll probably get resident evil 9 yeah yeah, and that and that'll be interesting going into you know the next generation, especially with like the new Unreal Engine and everything. Oh, I can't wait! I can't wait! It's gonna be so realistic. And if they continue to progress- Resident Evil Survivor. In 1998, a disaster struck the quiet Midwestern residents of Raccoon City. An uncontrollable outbreak of the umbrella-created T-Virus transformed the city into an inescapable death trap. To stop the outbreak from spreading, Umbrella Incorporated was forced to wipe out the entire city. However, this was not the only location where an outbreak occurred.
Where? Where am I? Oh! I... I don't remember anything. Who am I? You... You look familiar, but... Oh... Um, but I just can't remember. Ark Thompson, huh? Though I can't remember anything, I know that this was no way for anyone to die. What? And, and if they continue the trajectory that they've been going with 7 and 8, you know, uh, or Biohazard and Village, I mean... I, I can only imagine how visceral that experience can be. And it's actually nice because we're getting the classic Resident Evil gameplay with the remakes. And we're getting this new generation of games that actually takes a first-person perspective and combines it well with survival horror. It takes notes from games like Outlast or like the one we're going to talk about here in a minute, Clock Tower. Yeah. You know, with less of a focus on action and, you know, more of a focus on being able to uh, maneuver your way past, uh, you know, stalking enemies. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we should go ahead and start talking about Clock Tower, right? <laughs> Honestly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that's a good little segue there. Because, I mean, I, I, Clock Tower is pretty much like the absolute polar opposite of Resident Evil Survivor. Absolute well, polar opposite. A 100%. Where we have one game that's too much action and not enough survival horror, this game is all survival horror. There is no action. There are no weapons. Again, this is going to be similar to things like Outlast or Amnesia. Yeah. Uh, games like that. And uh, this game came out way the hell before that. You know, it's surprising is that I'd never heard of this. It's so underrated and having the chance to play this made me think like why the fuck isn't this series still coming why don't we have a port or a remake of this game a remake of this game which by the way would be through capcom because capcom is who bought the rights to this game and they they released the third game in the franchise which is kind of a kind of a cult to horror horror game in its own right well but, there you go like, yeah but i mean the yeah this first clock tower it has you know it has a mechanic to it that really kind of ups your angst and everything. It's a very angst-driven kind of horror. 100%. Yeah. And, and if it was to be upgraded into an actual, into a modern sense, it's like, oh my God, it could actually be pretty terrifying. Or they could <laughs> drop the ball entirely. I don't know, because... You have to remember that this style of game was even different from what we were used to with Resident Evil. Yeah. I wouldn't even call this a Resident Evil clone because it's a point and click adventure pretty much. It's, it's very a, different. It's a point and click survival horror game. Yeah, it is. And you know what? That actually captivated me right away. I love the the point and click style of gameplay. It honestly takes that element of some of the early Resident Evil or Silent Hill games where, you know, the disorienting uh tank controls and camera perspectives can fuck you up and it, it, it actually kind of takes that aspect in a completely different route with the point and click because you're trying to run away from this being that's constantly stalking you and you don't know because you know is he roaming around in real time or is he scripted to come pop out of this this area you don't know um you refer to this as the first game earlier it's not technically the first game. It's actually the sequel to the Super Nintendo game, which was never released in America. Yeah, so this game got the Final Fantasy or Fire Emblem treatment where, um, you know, part of the series was Japan exclusive. And then, uh, you know, the first game to come out in the States was simply titled Clock Tower. And so if, if uh, you've never played the Super Famicom version, and I haven't, um, don't worry, you won't be lost. The game actually uh, does a good enough job of explaining the story on its own because I was completely unaware there was a prequel, but it does take place after the events and features you know, returning characters from the first game on the Super Famicom. Yeah, and I actually do have a fan translation of the original game on you the do? Super Nintendo, and I've played a little bit of it, and it's very similar. I mean, it's actually pretty much a 2D version of what you get here. But I think that that's really why the first game kind of falls a little flat is because this type of gameplay it makes more sense in a 3d plane 
You know, like yeah, like we have a playthrough of it going on right now, and yeah, you have these uh, camera angles where you're looking at the entire room, and you can kind of explore around a little bit. Like you have a little more freedom of movement here, and a little more freedom, a little more freedom to look for items in the environment that might help you defeat Scissor Man. It does have the fixed camera angles, and and I think that's necessary here because of the the, the control style. So in that sense, you know, you could make a, a comparison with Resident Evil. But, I mean, that's pretty much where the comparisons end. Um, like I said, this game doesn't have very much action to speak of. Uh, all you do whenever the Scissor Man comes after you and during these scenarios is you can hide, although he might find you, or you can uh, u- utilize an, an, uh, an item in the environment one time only that will incapacitate him Take him down for a little while, and you can run away and find another route. But at any point later on, you know, you don't know when the fuck he's going to come after you. You know, and even in the first scenario where you're playing as Jennifer here at the research building, or I guess you can also play as Helen depending on what choices you make. Yeah. Because this is another branching storyline. Very Silent Hill, right? Very Silent Hill. And there's many moments throughout this game where you have a... a, uh chance to kind of branch the story off into different ways yeah and there's actually multiple endings in this game like several of them actually right that's kind of why i compared it to silent hill because i'd heard about that but yeah even in the first scenario you know you're trying to run away from the scissor men uh and you're you're playing as your female protagonist and just trying to get out of this area that's ultimately the goal and i guess that is kind of the goal in each scenario is you know, get away, get out of the place that you're in and get away the fuck away from the scissor man. And that, what's cool about that is that it, it pretty much establishes the first ever slasher movie uh, simulator, kind of. Mm-hmm. This is kind of the first in that particular genre. I mean, now we have stuff like uh, Dead by Daylight. That's a slasher, uh, uh, PvP slasher uh, uh-huh. uh, game. And uh, you also have the Friday the 13th game. You know, it, yeah, it, both both in the back in the Nintendo days and the newest one. That's true, and and I mean that's what this feels like. This feels like you are literally playing a straight up slasher movie. You are the final girl or the or the uh, victim, as it were, in a slasher movie. Yeah, that that is definitely the way that it comes across. I mean, it does kind of have that final girl feel, and all you're trying to do is get through the scenario and survive now in between these segments you also have these uh intermissions where you can kind of you can actually go to it, different places on the map at your leisure and talk with certain characters and progress the story along it's nice that we have these little segments in between because it helps keep the tension down and but before you know it you're stuck in somewhere with scissor man again and what's funny is i didn't even know about the uh the ability to escape during the panic mode i was trying to figure out because i saw the cursor flashing colors and i'm like and the, and the game gives you plenty of time while it's doing that it's like it seems like i should be able to do something to get out of the situation and you can but it's not a for sure thing and it just gives you an opportunity to run away uh, and that helps in moments like the one we're watching on the screen right now you know uh in this scenario Jen- jennifer walks into a room and the scissor man comes out of the fucking locker yeah he just pops out of nowhere he just like surprise bitch and then just starts coming at you and I do like the animation with the scissor man and everything. I mean, he has this real kind of stumbling kind of, you know, gait to him. He's very slow. I mean, not unlike a zombie, but he can he can catch up to you quickly enough if you let him. Yeah. You know, and, you know, hiding, that's like one of my favorite elements of this game. You know, it's like it was one of my favorite parts of the mechanics here is like, I mean, and, and it's something that has actually influenced other games as well. You know, like I, like I mean, I think Outlast has that mechanic Let's say to it. Outlast has Hello, the same. Mechanic. Hello Neighbor has that uh, mechanic to it somewhat. Yeah, and I mean, th- this was kind of innovative in that respect, which in a way almost makes it kind of a stealth game, sort of. Yeah, I mean, it definitely has that element to it, but you know, it's not nearly as effective as it is in in some other in other modern games. Um, well, okay, it's not as the the game is effective what i mean to say is is it's not as reliable 
Um, yeah, yeah. Hiding is something that, you know, basically you've got a 50-50 chance he might find you. Um, you know, he's sitting here in the bathroom stall, you know, is he going to come through? Uh, I, I believe in the bathroom stall there is a way to incapacitate him if he comes after you, but if you're hiding in one of those lockers, the fuck are you going to do? He's come. He's got you. It's an instant death. So, you know, hiding is something that's that it's just it's a very tense atmosphere all throughout. You've got this creature who's just Oh the f- fuck! Oh, he's right shit. there. He's right there, bro. He was waiting for her to come out. Dude, what the fuck? He does that? Yeah, yeah, he will straight up wait. He will wait he will silently wait for you. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah, I mean the AI for Scissor Man is actually very interesting, honestly. Yeah, is is he smart enough to like for instance like he'll keep checking the same places if you I don't know. I have never really seen him do that. But I mean, it does seem like it seems like that they would have could have introduced that mechanic somewhere along the line. See, and again, here's this tense situation where you're trying to run up these stairs, you know. Yeah, and he and he's still following you. He goes up the stairs and he's You can tell when he's pursuing you because you'll be limited by your actions. You'll hear the music, and if he's in the same room as you, you'll hear him. And again, he's very slow, but it's still a very tense atmosphere and also, if you know he manages to uh, to to catch you in a corner to corner you, then you're fucked. And that actually happened to me in this last playthrough. Although I didn't realize there was a way to get past him in the panic mode. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, he she's hiding in the in the bathroom again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, Ash is watching the the footage now. Sink a sink. <laughs> you know what's also cool is, or you know how many things there are to do uh, while you're in these situations. Like especially in the scenarios, is you're in these high stakes situations. So you think, you know, hey, I want to prioritize escape, but you know, it, it is worth it to go into different rooms and to check them out and to figure out, you know, what's what you have because that's actually ultimately going to affect the storyline and the ending of the game, or so I've heard, or uh, what decisions that you make during the intermissions. It's going to have a big difference on even what scenarios you're going to play and, and ultimately what ending you get. Yeah, it's it's interesting how this game really kind of parses that out, you know? And and all the, all the endings are actually really interesting in their own right. Like, I think that maybe I only got a few endings the first few times that I played through this game back in the day, because I used to own the physical copy of this. Uh, and I played it on original hardware and everything, but I mean, I, I just like the anxiety that it gives you. You know, it's total anxiety. It's all, it's all about anxiety. You're just like, oh my god, what is going to happen when I come into this room? Like, what the fuck? It, it's something that Resident Evil ended up using more effectively in certain entries. You know, like Resident Evil Two or Resident Evil Seven or Eight. Hell, in Resident Evil Three, they three. actually had the uh, branching off uh, choice uh, mechanic in that game as well. Yeah, so I, you know, I like the idea of just the solitary figure who's stalking you, you know, who can come around at any time and and get you, and you constantly have to be ready for. It. Like I said, there's there, like you said, there is a lot of anxiety produced by that, and so it causes you maybe to possibly overlook situations or not, to, you know, to miss certain rooms because you know it's a very it's a very uh, one time chance, you know, you miss picking up this item. Well, now you can't get the good ending. <laughs> yeah. And and might I add, even the panic mechanic was uh, eventually kind of introduced in other games, namely in uh, the first Dino Crisis. Like, I mean, I remember the uh, creator of that game said that that was less survival horror and more like survival panic. Yeah, so, okay. And so, I mean, that's kind of another way that this game kind of influenced other uh, survival horror franchises. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It definitely feels influential, and I'm just surprised that this isn't talked about as much as uh, I think could that be. I think that the third game is remembered a little more fondly because I mean it it, it had some different mechanics in its own right. It, it actually had boss battles. Okay, it had uh, it had like multiple uh, in- enemies through uh, multiple uh, scenarios, and and the boss battles were w- interesting because you had a weapon, but it was like a spirit weapon. It was like a bow and arrow type thing, you know, like a Quincy. From uh, Bleach. A Quincy. It was kind of yeah. like that, pretty much. <laughs> but it that was a uh, it was an interesting game. Very different. Very Capcom. That, look, the computers all say kill. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing is that there's kind of supposedly a supernatural element to Scissor Man as a character. That and and I think that does go back to the original game because the original game had a little bit of a haunted house feel to it as well. 
And uh, that's kind of brought up a little more here, although I think that more of the actual slasher killer vibes are kind of played a little more heavily here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, yeah, I like how, like, there's, uh, I was in one room, and, you know, the fax machine rings. And you're like, oh, fuck. And then you see there's a page that comes out, and he's like, I'm coming to get you. And you're like, oh. Yeah, get ready. I'm coming to get you. It's like this <laughs> Does he know I'm in this room? It's like, yeah, and, and that goes back to the supernatural factor, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, and, and why he's able to just kind of pop out of lockers randomly and shit. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's, this game, Clock Tower, is an effective uh, entry of, uh, uh, in the survival horror genre. I definitely recommend it to anybody that has a chance to play it. Uh, like I said, we played it on Bo's modded PS Classic. Yeah, but if you can get it on uh, on actual original hardware and you can get the original game, I highly recommend you do. I, I think it's a little bit of a collector's item now because it, it's remembered so fondly as being just so different uh, in, from other survival horror games of that time. I imagine this game can be emulated fairly well. I mean, it probably would play really well with a mouse. It probably really would. I would imagine so. Because, I mean, yeah, point-and-click adventure, you know? It's like it's pretty much made for a mouse. And I, I think that there was a Sony PlayStation mouse peripheral that came out back in the day. I, I, I never had one. I don't know anybody that had one, if there was. But, yeah, the, the this really has that uh, element to it of all the old-school, you know, Monkey Island point-and-click adventures. It just And it, it just translates in a way that in the horror genre where it makes the most sense, you know? Yeah. It makes the most sense to have this mechanic like this. Right. So, uh, yeah, anyway, I I really thoroughly enjoyed this game. I would love to play some more and check out the endings, get to know the characters better because there's just a lot going on here. And I love how well fleshed out each character feels. Yeah, and it did get a sequel on PS1, which plays much the same way, but I don't think it continues the Scissor Man uh, story. Okay, that's interesting because, you know, this game continued the same Scissor Man story from the Super Famicom game. Yeah, but I mean that's pretty much a very fully contained story to two games. the the other The other two games they have like nothing to do with this at all. Interesting. Do like, they even take place in the same universe? I don't think so. I mean, don't don't quote me on that. I haven't really played through the second game because the second game is not nearly as good as this one. Like, which is weird because it has a lot of the same uh, mechanics, but I guess it just didn't have as compelling a story like without the scissor man and everything so i mean i it just wasn't really received as well i gotcha yeah but anyway i i yeah i was really happy with uh with clock tower i'd love to see more i mean this game could get ported over to mobile devices and would probably still work pretty well it probably would it's all just point and click so i'd love to see a port i'd love to definitely love to see a remake that would be amazing yeah, Capcom, get on that. You know, it's like y'all have the property last I checked. So and let Resident Evil Survivor burn. <laughs> yeah, leave that in the dustbin of history. We can we can just leave that behind entirely. Sounds crazy, but it looks like they were killed with a giant pair of scissors. The giant scissors once again search for prey. A trail of terror stretches across Europe, from Norway to England. Here it is, the Barrow's Mansion. We have to go there and look around, or we'll never solve the mystery of scissor men. Got to be joking. It's way too dangerous. As long as he's alive, we're not safe anywhere, Doc. One after another, <gasps> the horrifying murders continue. Ah! 
will make it through this game of murder alive. Clock Tower. Well, anywho, Boo, since your guest, Boo, Bo, Boo, Boo, anyway, Bo, since you're guest hosting on this episode, uh, would you like to plug Collateral Cinema? We're going to get some more content out here very soon. We're going to have a new director's cut. It's going to be a uh, full-on uh, movie commentary, and it's going to be Demonic Toys, Charles Band's legendary, uh, legendary doll horror. You know, which is what he's kind of into. You know, it's a lot of fun. It, it's a fun movie. It really is. I enjoyed it a lot, and it, it's one of my favorite Full Moon movies. And I mean, we're going to have a lot of fun uh, riffing on it, you know, talking about the movie a little bit. And honestly, hopefully we'll, you, everybody who has this movie or can access the movie somewhere, it's like, listen to it with our commentary and have some fun with us. So, yeah. And we'll also have some other Director's Cut episodes coming out. I would like to do another Adult Swim themed one because that was actually a pretty uh, successful episode. Yeah, that would be cool. And we should still have our big Mega Cowboy Bebop special coming with Retro Anime Podcast. I need to get with them. They they said they wanted to do it during the summer. So, I mean, here we are in the summer. It's like, yeah, it's definitely summer. <laughs> so, yeah, look for that. And in October, we will start season six. Uh, we haven't really programmed our season yet, but... We've picked some. We picked some interesting movies this time around. I I think that people will really enjoy this season. So, so it was sacrifice. Both parts have been recorded. I'm just you know waiting editing that one. I'll have that out very soon. Uh, honestly, I like to have that out by the end of the week. Uh, and I'm hoping to publish this as soon as we record it. So uh, we'll see how that goes. And then we'll be finishing the season off with Fire Emblem. So we should be all done by July. And then we'll be starting back up in September with Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VII Remake. seven kind of armchair enthusiast like i've played through that game so many times before i know it like the back of my hand so i know every time we fucking play it together fuck yeah be fun gaming season five so check us out on patreon if you want to become a patron you get access to our exclusive full-length uh let's play video game commentaries and we will do more if uh well we'll do more regardless but we'll definitely be more motivated with more patrons uh we do have one patron already so thank you so much for that i think uh i think i think his name uh oh, was, yeah, Ro was Robert? Yeah, yeah, we're going to bring up the name. We're going to bring up the Patreon. We're gonna we're gonna give you a shout out, bro. One active patron of Collateral Gaming. Oh, okay. His name is Robert. Thanks, Robert. We'll shout you out again because we do appreciate that. Uh -huh. That definitely motivates me. And I think during the interseason break, we are going to definitely be releasing some more uh, commentaries, catching up on our commentary series that we've been doing. And uh, pretty soon here, I would also love to do another bonus round commentary. Dude, let's do a bonus round commentary on Resident Evil Survivor. That would be fun. <laughs> that was originally Damn it. Yeah, yeah, you need to go find that, dude. That's kind of important. You know, I just get kind of got lazy. Yeah. So, but. Podcasts or feedback on your platform of choice. You can find Collateral Gaming and Collateral Cinema wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, 
Spotify, YouTube, Google, you name it. We're there, and if we're not there, then we want to be there, so let us know. You can also check us out on the social medias. We have a Twitter, Instagram, and a Facebook, and we try to be pretty active with those. Yeah. Podcasts, that's the name of the group, and also uh, Collateral Cinema, at C Cinema Podcast on Twitter, and also on Instagram. So, And uh, check us out on Good Pods as well. Fuck Definitely. Yeah. We charted once again, so th- thank you for listening to us and uh, reviewing us there. So yeah, just continue, um, continue interacting with us there. Yeah. And I'm Bo Maddox. We are out. Wait, I'm Vincent? (laughs) No! Don't sue us. We're poor.